Welcome, Joseph, to Executive Peaks. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Do you have a morning ritual? What is it? What is my morning ritual? Well, basically, when I wake up, I um, go through kind of a mental procedure and a little audio telling myself to uh, clear my mind of any negative thoughts, and I kind of reprogram myself for the day's events. What is the best constructive guidance that you've received in your career? Well, a couple of things from my parents. My mother's favorite saying was, you'll always find a helping hand at the end of your own arm. And my my father used to say, don't tell me, show me. So basically, I lived kind of by those two rules there. Basically, action speaks louder than words. Which brings us to what is the life mantra that you live by? Well, the life mantra that I live by basically is, if you wake up in the morning and you're breathing, you still have stuff to do. <laughs> you also happen to be an author. In your book, What I Will, I Can, you showcase 21 key principles. How did you narrow it down to 21? Well, that's interesting that you should ask that. I, I used to have a private practice working with people, helping them to reprogram their subconscious. And I had a lot of different techniques that I used and things, but in in, 20, um, nine, in 2009, I lost my son, and that was very devastating for me. And I live out in the hills here in the mountains and stuff. And every day I would walk the hills, kind of shouting at the moon, saying why, what's going on, everything else. And after uh, months and months of walking and shouting and <laughs> trying to figure things out, things would start to come come to me. And I had I used to carry a little tablet with me, and I'd start jotting down say phrases or ideas and things and after a year of doing all of that I ended up with a stack of notes and things and I went home and kind of put them all together in order and I found out that uh, they all focused around basically 21 key precepts. Out of the 21 is there anyone that is challenging to master? Well I think for me one of the biggest things and I think for most people is the so-called golden rule that says treat everyone the way you would like to be treated. I I think that's um, that was completely misquoted when it was originally written, I think, mistranslated or whatever, because that causes more problems than anything else. Actually, it should state treat everyone the way they want to be treated, not the way you want to be treated. I think uh, that's the big misconception. We do that a lot for like Christmas when we give presents. We tend to give people presents that we like, and then we're kind of insulted when they don't get thrilled about it. So I think we need to see things through other people's eyes. Having the successes and challenges that you work through, what is the most important decision you've made in your life? Well, for me, one of the great motivators, Zig Ziglar, said it's really sad that so many people go to their graves with their songs unsung. We come into this world loaded with potentiality. We have all these talents and traits completely unique unto us. There are no two people on the face of the earth exactly alike. And we'll never know what, we, what we're capable of, and neither will each individual, myself or anyone, unless we go for it. So I'm constantly reminded that I'm loaded with all this potentiality. And unless I bring it out, the world will never know, and neither will I. At what point in your career path did you become a speaker? Well, originally, I started out as a stand-up comedian. And I was a stand-up comedian in the greater Chicago area. And then when I got drafted, I went to Europe in the Army, and I started entertaining the troops. And I this was during the Vietnam era. I used to entertain all the troops. And then I used to always have kind of a positive tone to everything. And somebody asked me, a corporation one time asked if I would come over and give them a little pep talk. And I kind of start switching things towards basically motivating people to believe in themselves. Nelson Mandela in his inaugural address said, our greatest fear is not that we're inadequate, but that we're more powerful than we can ever imagine. And I think the average person doesn't realize that that we are creators. We need to just start tapping into the potential inside of us and bringing it out. Coming from a family of 11, what communication skills did you acquire? Well, uh, when you have 11 people in a house, especially around dinner time or something, if you don't talk, you don't eat. It seems like everybody, um, one of the first things you learn is cooperation. 
I think cooperation is one of the key things and uh, not to keep things bottled up. We learned how to share very quickly. We learned how to cooperate very quickly. Quickly, We learned that we can get more done if we work as a team, if we work together instead of independently against each other. So I learned a lot of great communication skills through my family. And then later when I went to the university, my, my advanced degrees are in interpersonal communication. Revisiting your stand-up work, what do you find funny? Oh, I find everyday events funny. I used to get most, originally, I used to get most of my material from my family because a lot of things would uh, would happen within the family. And then later on, when I was in the Army, I used to use a lot of military humor and stuff. But life itself is funny. It's all a matter of perspective. It's the way you look at things. But uh, there's material everywhere you go. Life, life, basically, if you look, it's all perception. There are a lot of funny things happening now. Joseph, when the heart and mind don't agree, what do you do? Well, basically... Even Einstein said, originally, we were meant to think with our heart and temper it with our mind. We have it backwards. We always try to solve problems. We first go to our head and we kind of rack our brain trying to think of solutions and things. And that was that's totally wrong. The brain was never meant to think. The brain was meant to identify the issue or identify the problem. And then the heart is what brings it forward. We think with our think and feel with our heart. And that's where the solutions actually come from. Having also written Tools for Life in helping people self-actualize, what is the biggest ingredient needed in order to self-actualize any goal? Believing in yourself. I think that's so key. And unfortunately, so many people listen to other people about themselves because everybody's got an opinion about us and it's usually wrong. The only person we need to listen to is ourself. We need to listen to that inner voice because that knows what's best for us. And so what other people say with their mouth to us and everything could have a little impression on us and everything. But what really matters is what we say to ourselves with our mouth because it imprints on the subconscious and it becomes our total belief that. So we have to watch what we say about ourselves with our mouth. You have many skills. Do you have any hidden talent? Well, I I think, uh, I guess you could say more of a peacemaker and everything. I think it's important uh, that there's resolution between people when there's conflict. Basically, when there's conflict, it's usually just a matter of a breakdown in communication. And being a communication guy, I like to think that I uh, can kind of get in the middle of things. And through discussion and communication, we can work things out. So I guess you can call that a, a talent, if you will bringing people together. Speaking of communication, in your opinion, what is the number one mistake or error that people engage in when it comes to communicating? Well, the the key is I, when I was uh, teaching in the school system, I taught high school and university and such, and I taught debate. And the key is making sure you do your research. A lot of the major conflicts between people is that they don't have enough facts. And a lot of times they're totally wrong because they only have partial information on a particular subject. So it's very important that you really research and know what you're talking about before you open your mouth. (laughs) Joseph, what is the biggest misconception about you? Well, I think a lot of people think because I'm a speaker and a lecturer and I've written three books that I'm very outgoing. And in reality, I tend to be very reserved and shy. Do you have a comfort food? A comfort food. Well, being Italian, lasagna is my favorite comfort food. Yes. <laughs> being raised in Chicago, what is one thing that is so unique about Chicago compared to other cities? Well, we used to think that we uh, were kind of the center of the universe. If you'll set, we, we thought we we spoke quite good American, if you will. And <laughs> we fi- I find in my travels, if I'm in New York or California or something, everybody says I have a Chicago accent, which I was unaware of. I didn't know that we Chicagoans had an accent, but I, f- I find that very unique. I think every region of America has its inclination towards an accent. What is one tip you could give for helping people become more decisive in life? Well, my tip would be to do it, not to hesitate. Uh, We can overthink things. And if you try to overthink things, it'll never happen. And you're born, as I mentioned before, you're born with all this. Each one of us is born with all this potentiality inside. We don't have to have 
all the knowledge in order to go forward on a particular thing. And it has nothing to do with the color of our skin or our age or where we were raised. None of that matters because we're prepackaged towards particular things. If you hear that inner voice and you get an inkling to go off in a direction, you have to follow it. You can't make excuses and say, well, I'm too old now or I'm not educated enough. That's not true, simply not true, because we basically, every one of us is a success waiting to happen. Do you all have strengths? How do you work with your weaknesses? Do you accept them or do you work towards improving them? Oh, always towards improving them if it's a desire. I mean, we have weaknesses in certain areas that, uh, you know, there's no real need to perfect them because we have no interest in them. But I think anything that, that we're aiming towards that we're starting out to work on or something, obviously we're not going to be perfect at it. So it takes constant reworking and working and honing and toning down and shaping up. As a speaker, do you have a tip for those that are developing themselves to become better speakers? Oh, yes. I used to teach speech, um, public speaking classes and everything. And so many people say, what do I do with the nervousness? How come I'm always nervous and everything? And a lot has to do with your focus. If you're worried about how you're going to do on stage and whether you're going to be shaking or whether you're going to be doing this or doing that, basically, you're completely off focus. And in actuality, basically, you're being egotistical because you're focusing on you instead of the message. So the key is to focus on the message. When you're at the supermarket or out somewhere at a sports game or something, you're turning to your friend, you don't pre-think how you're going to act when you say things. You just say them because you're focused on the message. So for public speakers, the key is to make sure their focus is on the message and not on themselves. And as a comedian, what tip would you have for someone wanting to pursue comedy? Well, comedy is, that's that's a very good Good question, because there are so many different types of comedy. And the thing is basically to start observing people. As I mentioned before, the best material comes from from your surroundings, from the public. And with professional comedians, we used to say you need to use what we call common denominator, things that everybody can identify with. So you talk about things that everyone can relate to. And we've all had issues with different things. There are some comedians who'll start talking and you can see people in the audience nodding, saying, yeah, I know just what you're talking about. I've been there. And that's kind of the key. Find a lot of common denominators. Are there any exciting projects you're working on right now? Well, I'm working on a fourth book right now, and it's going to be kind of a combination of uh, some of my comedy, my stand-up comedy stuff and, uh, and positive thinking. I think now we need now more than ever we need to start to introduce people to themselves to realize their potentiality and start using it. So too often now people are seeing themselves as victims and ineffective. I've got friends that would say things like I can't do anything now. What what good does it do for me to do anything? I'm powerless. And that's that's not true at all. We are incredibly powerful. We are creators as we think so we create. Because you hold a special connection with students of all ages out there, is there a class that you believe that should be taught in school? Oh, definitely. Um, basically, it's communication. It's, um, I don't want to say public speaking, but oral communication. I taught at a school where the principal, a beautiful man, he mandated that every single student in the school went through a six-week course with me in learning oral communication. And I get letters literally now 20 and 30 years later from people saying that that was one of the best classes they ever had because it opened the door for them, showing them how to express what's on their mind without getting all nervous or throwing up or fainting. Joseph, what is the last thing you do before calling it a day? Well, I kind of assess the day basically, and I give thanks uh, certainly, uh, that I was able to do the, the things that I did during the course of the day. I think action speaks louder than words. I mean, we could think about a lot of things, but until we do them and bring them to fruit, nothing gets done. So I'm uh, very uh, happy in what I accomplish on a daily basis, and I give thanks. For and because you were so humble in sharing your son's passing, do you have any guidance for anyone going through a phase of grief? Well, I would say, first of all, 
every grief is different for every person and the length of grieving is different for every person. There's no rules when something like that happens. And sometimes people say, gee, you've been grieving for a half a year. Aren't you done yet? Or a year, you know, it's time to snap out of it. There's no such thing. It happens when it happens. Um, I say, take all the time you need, but realize that life goes on also. It's not the time to stop then because so you're missing a loved one. That loved one will always be with you, certainly in your heart, but it's time for you to continue and be all that you can be. As long as you're on this earth, you have things to do. And finally, what do you do and where can people contact you? They can contact me on my website. Uh, I have two. The, the basic one is what I will, I can dot com. And I have my books on there and there, some of them are discounted and everything else. And it'll give a good explanative. I do a lot of self-empowerment work with that. It's what I will, I can dot com. Or they can go directly to my personal website, which is Joseph Giampapa dot com and that's a long italian name <laughs> i'm sure if uh, you have it anywhere in the uh, the visuals there it'll be g-i-a-m-p-a-p-a -P -P -A, joseph g and papa so either one of those websites um, all my information is there and they can contact me through joseph thank you so much for joining us on executive oh it's been my pleasure thank you very much <laughs> <laughs>